Welcome to our sharing on the second half of St. John's Gospel. We are now in chapter 20 and today I want to deal with the appearance to Mary of Magdala. So I want to pick up in uh, verse 11. Meanwhile, Mary stayed outside near the tomb, weeping. Then, still weeping, she stooped to look inside and saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said, Woman, why are you weeping? They have taken my Lord away, she replied, and I don't know where they put him. Now notice Mary doesn't say they've taken the corpse away. They've taken my Lord away. And as she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, though she did not recognize him. Jesus said, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? There's the very important question that we have been meeting since the very beginning of the Gospel. Who are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go and remove him. Jesus said, Mary. She recognized him then and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means master. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go and find the brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So Mary of Magdala went and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. We're going to have to take this slowly. There's much more in it than appears to the eye. Uh, in fact, John deals with this text at two different levels. I don't mean the below level and the higher level, but uh, dealing with it from two completely uh, separate angles. And I want to do both with you because one illustrates the other and opens up uh, the depths of what is being said here. So the, the Christ has risen from the dead. The great event has happened. But we learned in the final discourse that Jesus isn't alone. There are branches on the vine. And if the vine is to truly rise, the branches have to rise as well. And using a different image, Jesus has a mystical body. And it's not enough for the head to rise from the dead. The body has to rise from the dead as well. And it's much, much harder for the body to rise from the dead than it is for the head. We saw in the last episode that when they came to the tomb, it was all over. No fanfare, no noise, no nothing. It all happened almost in an instant. But raising the church from the dead is going to be very heavy, very cumbersome, very troublesome, and so on. It's much, much more difficult. And so we have left the disciples in mourning and in tears. Uh, and now, how on earth do you get them to rise from the dead? So what John does is he takes the whole issue of the resurrection from a completely different angle to the uh, synoptic gospels as usual. In dealing with just three incidents, John can tell you everything. And it's because he's looking at it from his own unique perspective. And that, this is why it's, it's really marvelous. Now, taking Mary of Magdala, we're going to take her first of all as a, a beloved disciple who truly loved Jesus, was totally committed to him, and her problem of actually recognizing the risen Lord. That's the first level we want to deal with. And then uh, we'll go back over all the same material again, looking at Mary of Magdala as a symbol of the church. And so all that we say in the first uh, reading is going to be necessary to explain what happens for the raising of the church. So let's go back to Mary, the individual, the individual disciple. 
And she had been there on Calvary. She had witnessed, she had seen the wounds for herself. She had seen the bloody mess they had made of Jesus's body. She was clinging to the cross. And so some of that blood would have come on herself and her own clothing as well. A crucifixion is brutal, is terrible, and it's terrifying. But Mary loved Jesus so much that she just braved the, the insults of the world. She braved everything to be with her Savior. Jesus had raised her from the dead spiritually. He had raised her from a terrible place that she had been in. And she was going to stay with him in life, in death, and in resurrection. The most wonderful thing I can say about Mary of Magdala, well, there's a lot you can say about her, but if you wrote her biography, you could write it in three sentences. She clung to him in life, she clung to him in death, and she clung to him in resurrection. And afterwards, when the church was persecuted, um, Mary was one of the disciples that actually went to France and became uh, a hermit in France for 36 years, living in adoration of the Lamb. All that evidence is in France, uh, where the, the shrine of Mary of Magdala is there. I've been there, very impressed by all the witness that's there. So if you have witnessed somebody being brutalized on a Friday, it is extremely difficult for the, the mind to take on board that that person could survive that experience. She had been present when Jesus was wrapped up in shrouds and all the spices were put on him. She was present at his burial. So taking on board a resurrection is well nigh impossible. And I'm just talking from a purely human point of view. And it is extremely important for us to understand how difficult the resurrection was for the original witnesses. And if we look at their difficulties, if we look at their struggle in trying to recognize Jesus uh, and trying to accept what, what is happening and the results of it for themselves, then it helps us to deal with it as well. Sometimes we just uh, take our faith on a very superficial level. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ has come again. It's totally superficial. We, we don't actually go into it. If we really went into all the, the details, we ourselves would rise from the dead. And when you would see what would have to happen uh, with us rising from the dead, we'd appreciate their struggles. So we're going to look at their struggles and John does it brilliantly. So it's only three days later. That was Friday. And this is early on Sunday morning. So her mind is not geared towards seeing somebody who is alive. One of the problems that all the witnesses had with Jesus in the resurrection was something very simple. And that is that resurrection changed him completely. He was totally changed. He was completely transformed. And so it was absolutely essential that he kept the marks of the wounds in his hands and his feet and his side as recognition points. Only gradually when they heard him speak and he came to them more and more that they recognized him fully. We're going to see at the end of this gospel uh, when Jesus meets his disciples uh, by the Sea of Galilee. They know it's him and they still have difficulty. And so uh, the, re the resurrection was not something easy to take on board, not at all. So it's understandable that the unbelieving world would completely dismiss it. Mary is going to see a person in front of her, but she's going to not recognize him. What she actually recognizes is the voice of her shepherd. I've already told you that in chapters 20 and 21, of uh, John's Gospel, that we're going to hear the um, teaching of Jesus 
in the early part of the gospel, it's going to all come back to us. And in John chapter 10, verse three, uh, Jesus said that his sheep would hear his voice and that one by one, he would call them out. And this is exactly what happens in the resurrection. He takes Mary of Magdala out of her darkness, out of her unbelief, out of her sorrow, and he goes ahead of her. And he does exactly the same thing for the 10 apostles that he meets on uh, Easter evening. And Thomas is missing. He comes back specially for Thomas. One by one, he calls them out. And we're going to see just how deeply in darkness and grief uh, and unbelief they actually are. And John 10, 3 says that the shepherd goes ahead of them and the sheep follow because they know or recognize his voice. That's terribly important. And so uh, in this incident, it's going to be extremely important for us to recognize the point of Mary's recognition. Mary and the others are also going to experience John 10, 14. I know my own and my own know me. Now, I've already explained the verb to know for you, that it is an intimate personal relationship with God and it bears fruit in the fruits of the Spirit. So only the disciples that were very close to Jesus and in this living relationship with the most blessed Trinity, they were the, uh, the ones that Jesus actually showed himself to. All the others with lesser faith, they wouldn't be able to cope at all. They, they would be probably scared witless at the idea of seeing Jesus in the resurrection. So he came to the ones who loved him the most and therefore he came only to a very small number of people, even though countless thousands had heard him during his mission. So these chosen ones are going to be his very special witnesses. They're the ones who are going to understand uh, what John wrote in his uh, prologue in chapter one and verse 14, where John said that the word was made flesh and he tabernacled among us and we saw his glory. Now John was one of the chief witnesses. We saw his glory. And that glory was the glory of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's what they begin to recognize. So the resurrection is much bigger than people actually realize. They have to now see Jesus as he really is, as the, the divine Son of God. They've got to see him as the second person of the most blessed Trinity. That person whom they loved, before Friday, the one that they called master, the one that they related to as a friend as well as a rabbi, they had never really penetrated the reality of who he was. And certainly the Sanhedrin had never uh, penetrated at all who he was. Otherwise, as St. Paul says, they could never have crucified the Lord of glory. It wouldn't have been possible. So uh, the very slow, recognition of these uh, disciples who are closest to Jesus is actually very important. The Gospel of Luke uh, in chapter 24 tells us uh, that Jesus actually ate and drank in their presence. This was to try and convince them that he was real. And as Luke 24, 39 says, that they were not dealing with a ghost, meaning something that's not really there, just some kind of a vision. And they were not seeing a vision as in their mind has produced some kind of a picture, that he was real, that he was flesh and blood in front of them. That was the thing that was so completely difficult to take on board. Because the whole world understands that when you're dead, you're dead, you're finished. And that's why the Sanhedrin were so sure that they were finished with this Jesus of Nazareth, that that problem was gone and they could get back to ordinary business. But they never did. And so what they have to try and take on board is the transformation that happened to Jesus in resurrection. Now, if you go to the Synoptic Gospels again, Jesus had helped uh, his three main witnesses uh, Peter, John and James, uh, to see him in transfiguration on Mount Tabor. 
So they have more help than anybody else. And we still have the problem that Peter could not take the evidence that he saw in the tomb. He just couldn't take it. So we have to appreciate how difficult this actually is. One of the things they noticed, you see, was that his body was different. The body that Jesus was showing here in the resurrection had different qualities than the body they knew before Friday. Because he could come through a closed wall. He didn't need doors. He could be present and then just simply disappear. He could be in many places at the same time. And so this, this other dimension, the, the supernatural, was breaking in on them. I'm trying to give you a picture in your mind that they are entombed and that he, the light of the world, has got to break in on their darkness. He has got to let heaven actually break in upon the earth. During the days of his incarnation, they tried to understand what it was intellectual understanding. And it's very limited. Uh, here in the resurrection, it is revelation they have to take and that they are touching God. They're actually touching the living God. And this is very transformative, but initially it's actually very frightening. So in these recognition stories, as the commentators call them, they find out who Jesus really is. It's only in the resurrection that they call him God. And we're going to hear Thomas saying, my Lord and my God. It's only in the resurrection you'll hear that. It is in the resurrection stories that we begin to somehow touch how he dwells among us. Because if they're in Jerusalem, he can break in on their, their meeting. If they're in Galilee, he's there at the shore waiting for them. No matter where they are, he can be with them. And so what he taught them in the final discourse now becomes very slowly begins to dawn on them what he was actually talking about. And one of the things that, that strikes them rather quickly is that all the promises he made in the final discourse, he actually keeps now. And the amazing thing is that that final discourse was given on a Thursday. and This is only Sunday. I mean, if somebody makes promises, you know, you might think, oh, it's months, it's years before it will be actually delivered. But Jesus delivered in three days. So let's come to Mary. Obviously, Mary came back to the tomb because she's been there before, gone back to the uh, apostles, told them that the body was stolen. Now she comes back to the tomb and she comes back to the tomb because that's the only place that she can connect with Jesus. That was the last place that she actually met Jesus of Nazareth, even though he was dead. And so she stood outside the empty tomb, but didn't go in. Mary seems to be paralyzed with grief. This is the action woman. This is the woman who would always think of what to do. And she's, she's paralyzed with grief. Finally, she looks in. She doesn't go in. She just simply looks in. She looks into the darkness where death is. Now, don't forget that this woman has been involved with the death of her brother, Lazarus, and the enormity of Jesus calling Lazarus out of the tomb. So she's been at a tomb before. She, she's had terrible grief before, and we have to remember this. But this time when she looks in, she sees two angelic figures, one at the top and the other at the foot of where the body of Jesus had lain. So the thing that strikes her is, this is not a robbery scene. Now, John doesn't tell us whether Mary saw the cloths or not. All John is saying is that with the vision of the angels, Heaven is trying to break in on this woman's sorrow. 
You remember what Jesus said? You will be weeping and wailing, but your sorrow will turn to joy. Now, it was extremely difficult for their sorrow to turn to joy. And so the vision of the angels actually does not cause Mary any rejoicing. There's a great lesson for us there. Mary only had eyes for Jesus. She had eyes for anybody else. And so a lesser vision was not acceptable to her. Nowadays, people's faith can be so poor that if they got a vision of angels, they write a book about it, which is really sad. So let us take the first lesson from Mary, and that is seek Jesus and you will find him. Thank you for listening. Sláin agus bánach they live. Goodbye. God bless you. Are you searching for fulfillment? Discover true happiness. Stay tuned to Shalom World.